the story of Nina Ole, ceramic artist, sculptor extraordinaire, conceptual artist. This story is an important one for all of us to understand. So many aspects of her work uh, are inspiring. Um, so I'm going to spend a little time talking about uh, someone who uh, thought of wood firing in many new ways, never really conceived of before, a remarkably innovative and generous artist. And so what you're looking at here is one of Nina's um, fire sculptures, a, a sculpture installation. She did these around the world. She flew into a location, uh, built these sculptures in one or two weeks, and then fired them uh, in a uh, pretty much in a, an overnight process. And so we're going to look at that. Uh, here is Nina herself. Uh, you get a little bit of a sense of what a warm, thoughtful, and uh, creative and joyful person she was. Uh, as you can tell, she's someone who I counted as a, a good friend. And here we are with our mutual friend Priscilla Mortison and uh, looking at uh, some remarkable rain that had come our way and uh, enjoying that uh, the rain uh, during a wood firing that we were doing together. But here again, let's talk about these, uh, these kind of on-site sculptural installations. Nina had wanted to find some way to engage with the art world at large, with the whole world, and to, to find a way to become more uh, involved uh, with uh, people, to bring something unique and valuable to others. And so she came up with this idea that started with the creation of a very simple foundation that could also serve as a very simple wood fire uh, kiln, uh, the base of a, a firebox. And then she would build her sculpture right on that firebox. So here you can see Nina is building her sculpture right on the firebox. And these, these hook shapes that you see are the secret of her design. And this was something she innovated. And if you study this picture, you can kind of get a sense of how it works. These J shapes or hook shapes uh, were made from slabs that were joined on one side. In, uh, on the top row of this piece, you can see them being joined together on the inside, but not quite joining on the outside, leaving a little rectangular window. And then on the row below, it's reversed. They're joined on the outside, but not joined on the inside. What this allows for is as the flame is moving through the piece from the bottom firebox, the, the flame can actually do that. It's just one thin slab of a piece because the flame is moving inside and outside of the entire piece. So it's got a better chance of surviving the firing. Here's another look at that method of construction. And you can see from this the uh, building up of the form with, um, with on a firebox uh, that will later be used to fire the piece. Here we're now looking at a finished piece. And these clay bars that are sticking out are used to keep the, uh, the covering, which you'll see is put on it, at a bit of a distance so that flame and air and heat can circulate. The pieces are then wrapped with a um, kale wool, a fiber blanket that is capable of maintaining very high temperatures. And then the, here is the early stages where the piece itself is the kiln and the chimney. And you can see a little smoke from the early preheating fire uh, coming out of the piece. And this is a two sculpture construction. So you can see first one piece is fired and then the next piece will be fired. But you can see that the, uh, the piece that isn't firing right now is being protected from the heat a little bit. And what's happening as, as she's firing this piece, um, you can see it beginning to gain temperature. Now she will fire this into the night, in fact, all the way until the pre-dawn, which is the darkest part of the night and just before morning. 
And so at the pre-dawn, she will begin to remove these glowing red hot uh, blankets and reveal the piece. Now this is um, quite an interesting process to do by removing the blankets. She's actually putting her work into a great deal of thermal dynamic stress. And she may be cutting down its livelihood, maybe cutting it in half from maybe that it'll last, instead of lasting you know, 30 years, it'll last 15 years from the cracking that'll occur. But that's not what she's concerned about. She's concerned about providing people a, um, an unforgettable aesthetic experience. And I've been present for one of these, and that's exactly what it is. It is a profound and beautiful, remarkable experience that you never forget. And it's so generous of Nina to be orchestrating these these events so that everybody, and there's lots and lots of people surround, in the dark here surrounding this piece uh, when it's unveiled. And when it's first unveiled, everybody's given um, packets of sawdust and perhaps some iron oxide and various things that they could throw on that might leave a little mark of smoke or of uh, stain from the oxides. And here are the pieces after firing. In this case, she went ahead and whitewashed the sculptures to fit in with uh, the landscape. So these are remarkable pieces, and in part they make beautiful sculptures in the in the um, environment, but they're really much more about um, this moment of revelation and of transformation that everybody experiences watching this happen. They're really remarkable events. Nina is also uh, quite an accomplished um, sculptor uh, making um, gallery size pieces. And here are some of her forms that she's uh, made over the years. Some of them quite complex abstract forms. often reference to architecture. So I wrote a couple of articles about Nina, um, most of them used for catalogs. And here's some of what I wrote that kind of gets across the experience of Nina's work. When it comes to Nina Ole's monumental fire sculptures, you have to be there. In fact, put it on your life list, the list you have of all the things you must do in this life. If you don't have a life list, start one and put Nina Ole's sculptures at the top. Ole's medium is not ceramic or even fire. With these sculptures, her medium, her focus, and her message is the human experience of awe. There is an extraordinary amount of labor and planning which precedes these fire sculpture events. Then, after much planning, labor from a multitude of helpers and a sleepless night or two, Nina Ole then takes great risks and often sacrifices permanence, all for one astonishing, miraculous moment, which move all sentient viewers to awe. If Ole was interested solely in the object she was creating, she would allow the piece to cool slowly, since much damage can occur if the piece is allowed to experience a rapid change in temperatures. But Ole is interested in creating a peak moment, an experience of awe. So just before the sun rises, when the dark sky has just a tinge beginning to light the horizon, and the piece is at its highest temperature, Ole pulls off the reflect, refractory fabric covering. Exposed is a huge glowing form. Everything around is illuminated by the light of its radiating heat. Faces are painted in orange radiance. The ancient architecture burns, and Ole is almost satisfied. If you are there just before an unveiling, you are given a packet or two with sawdust, copper, and maybe some salt in it. And as the piece is unveiled, Ole conducts the viewers in a showering symphony of sparks. As each thrown packet approaches the glowing sculpture with the stated intent of coloring the piece, it bursts into flames, a comet trailing sparks or a thousand sparkling constellations. Ole has enlisted you as a co-conspirator. You cannot remain a passive observer. You are co-creating in a fire a moment impossible to forget. This piece will perhaps not last as long due to the dramatic cooling, but it has existed gloriously for an instant in time, and that instant is burned indelibly into your soul in a way that you can neither forget nor describe. 
it is, well, well, you had to be there. And here's a beautiful picture of Nina next to one of her fire sculptures in progress. And here's that rain I was talking about during the wood fire that uh, we had together. It was such a remarkable rain. I had to take a picture of Nina through the rain. Uh, we did this beautiful fire, Nina and I and um, Pr Priscilla Mortison. NinaOle.com, you can go there and you can see lots of these projects and many videos where you can see the whole process unfold, the building and the unveiling, and I recommend seeing a few of those at least. Uh, since Nina is no longer with us, it's not possible to see a new sculpture, but you could experience uh, a video of her wonderful work. And here's a photograph of um, some really remarkable artists um, that uh, I was presenting with at a conference in Denmark. Not far from Nina's home, we uh, had a wood fire conference. This is my first teacher in wood firing. This is Fred Olson. Uh, this is Chester Neely from, um, from Australia. Remarkable artist and a real fun guy. We had an exhibition together at that conference. And this is John Neely, who teaches in Utah and is uh, one of the great uh, wood fire artists and uh, one of the early uh, presenters of the train kiln design, and of course there I am. And here is Nina, right in the center of things. And this was the last chance I had to see her. And this is a wonderful artist who now teaches with John in Utah, um, uh, Aneta. And so Nina um, and I had a really wonderful opportunity to visit during this conference. And just before we left, um, she gave me this. Um, it was a gift of hers. It was a ceramic envelope, which is kind of a powerful metaphor that I didn't quite understand at the time. But um, it's, a, it's an envelope that you cannot open. That little tag of paper had four mark written on it. And I have this hanging above my desk at home. It, um, Nina had was um, in recovery from cancer. She had she was in remission, and very soon after this meeting, she went. The cancer re-emerged, and she passed away. So I do miss her dearly. Um, these are a couple of things that I um, developed in talking about her work in various conferences throughout. Um, I did some conference presentations in Germany and um, in France. And this is what I would say about um, the aesthetics of wood fire and including Nina Ole. Uh, schooled in the presence of Rothko canvases, I find the work of some wood fire artists similarly trance-inducing. I find aesthetic transcendence in the contemplation of a bowl by Jeff Shapiro, a bottle by Owen Rye, or an Iga vase. In my fire paintings, I strive to create similar opportunities for aesthetic awe. Nina Ole traffics in transcendence and deserves special mention here. Her almost shamanistic installation fire performances are orchestrated to offer participants a remarkable transcendent experience. Wood fire envelops participants in her pre-dawn glorious revelations of monumental sculpture. These comparisons can guide us, but clinging too closely to them will mislead us. While both Kiefer and Carter are exploring holocausts of the human spirit, both embrace an aesthetic of the grim and the gritty, and both defying all reasons by creating inexplic inexplicable beauty and tragedy, Carter's wood-fired art brings an unflinching intimacy to his subject that permeates the viewer. Both Ole and Rothko traffic in transcendence. Ole's generous fire sculpture performances are something undreamed of by Rothko and his contemporaries. They are orchestrated to create a moment in the pre-dawn when all share transcendence. Nina Ole conspires to inspire awe.